Welcome to Balthazar, Beauty, Goodness, Truth, a series of conversations about the life and teachings of Swiss theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar, who is considered to be one of the most important Catholic intellectuals and writers of the 20th century. Incredibly prolific and diverse, he wrote over 100 books. He is also co-founder with Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger of the acclaimed theological journal, Communio. It is the purpose of this series of programs to introduce some of the themes of Balthasar's work, and perhaps to help some understand better why Hans Urs von Balthasar is so important for modern theology and for the lived experience of the Church today. Balthasar, Beauty, Goodness, Truth. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We now continue with part three of our conversation with Dr. Larry Chapp on Hans Urs von Balthasar's Love Alone is Credible. Larry, thank you again for having this incredible discussion on Hans Urs von Balthasar's Love Alone is Credible. An extraordinary work, even though it seems to be contained in such a small package, and it really unpacks one of the the great mysteries of our time, doesn't it? Well, as I was rereading this book to prepare for these podcasts, I I just was struck by how dense this little book is. But there's a reason for that. Mm -hmm. And that's because in a lot of ways, love alone, the way of Glaubhaftis Nuliba, is a kind of condensation of his argument from the theological aesthetic, from, you know, the first volumes of his trilogy. And so, and, you know, he's got, uh, well, let's see, there's a couple of other of his secondary works that are also condensations of the theodrama and the theologic and so on. And they're equally dense. So that's why Love Alone is important, because it really, it's laying out the contours of the argument that he then fleshes out in seven volumes of the aesthetic. So yes, beware, readers, you are not going to easily slide through 120 pages. It's going to take you some time. The great scholar of Balthazar that you are, Larry, check me on this, and this may be too simplistic, but he seems to set up a lot of his, how do I want to say this, his essays or his reflections on things in a manner that seems kind of like Aquinas to the extent that he sets up, okay, here's the big picture, and then he goes into an argument, and then he unpacks the answer to that argument. Is that correct? Well, I I think that's absolutely true. He sort of states the problematic. He then sort of steel mans the opposite point of view and says, gives it its due. In fact, he probably articulates the oppositional position better than the opposition does itself because he understands it from Mm -hmm. its roots more deeply. And then he unpacks why, in a sense, the Christological answer trumps those issues and trumps those problems. It really is his his modus operandi. Uh, And it's not Hegelian, despite what Archbishop Vigano said about Pope Benedict being a Hegelian. Uh, All Vigano meant by that was that Benedict does the same thing, states a problem, gives a standard response to the problem, and then proposes an alternative that, you know, deals with it. But apparently that's thesis, antithesis, synthesis, that's all heck. Anyway, I don't want to get off topic on that right now. The Balthazarian project, though, here in Love Alone, is is really, uh, really beautiful. And it does, it does, in a sense, do what you just said. In, in essence, the problematic that the entire aesthetic is trying to answer, and sort of love alone here as well, is the problem of particularity in Revelation. How can a single historical man, in a sense, be the absolute revela- revelation of the infinite God? So in some ways, Balthazar is trying to answer the objection born through the Enlightenment and, and thinkers like Gotthold Lessing who said the contingent truths of history cannot be the vehicles, vehicle for the eternal truths of reason or God or whatever. And so there's this sort of gulf, the gulf between contingency and eternity. It's very sort of almost platonic in its emphasis on the divided line Mm -hmm. between the the contingent and the non-contingent, the impassable and the passable. And so Balthazar is essentially trying to address here in the aesthetic and in love alone, This problem of the particularity in modernity is a reiteration in a new form of the old Gnostic 
the Gnostic sort of heresy of formlessness. Uh, you know, the idea that, that the spiritual is in a realm of formlessness and we are in a realm of contingent forms. And, and so in order to get at the spiritual, one needs to bracket the formal and needs to bracket the material. One needs to bracket the corruptible and the passable. Uh, and so in many ways, there's a great book by a, a guy named Kevin Mongrain. He was a student of Cyril O'Regan's at Notre Dame. And uh, his book was called, and based on his dissertation, was called uh, Balthazar and Irenaean uh, Retrieval. And his basic thesis was, yes, Balthazar is doing what Irenaeus did with the Gnostics. He's trying to show us why God's revelation in Christ is, in a sense, possible. And, and, and what it really tells us about, about the nature of God, that he can incarnate himself in a human being. So that's, that's the first thing I'd say, that, that Balthazar here is trying to show that the whole is in the fragment, as Balthazar calls it, das ganz im Fragment. The whole of God is in, apparently, the fragment of things. So he calls it the concrete universal, the absolute singularity. And so that's why the first volume of the aesthetic is all about seeing this form, this form that is the singularity, which is the whole in the part. For the person who will pick up Love Alone is Credible, for the average lay reader, I would say, who wants to explore this, this is a different type of presentation of ideas that we're used to in our current media situation. And I'm not just talking about uh, social media. I'm talking about books. A lot of times books that we get and we're diving deeper into uh, the mysteries of God, they can be almost journalistic. And so you expect to have an ease of introduction. But when you have Balthazar, actually you come across something that's very strong because it's a very strong statement. But what I found with this book as you move into his reflections on it towards about midway, and we're going to get there at, at some point, it, that's when it begins to really flow out. I mean, it just it becomes oh, yeah. so much more accessible. But you don't want to jump. You don't want to go to the middle no, of the book. You have to follow the argument, and it is a very analytical and meticulous argument, one block building on another. And so you're reading it and you're de- it's dense. You might be sort of nodding off because it's in the middle of the afternoon and you're saying to yourself, where is all this going? I can't tell. I don't know. Oh, I'll just flip to the end. Let's just see where it now. No, 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 no. You'll miss the entire thing if you do it that way. And so you're, you're so right. I mean, I once gave a paper. Actually, I, no, I was in Washington, D.C. I was going to say I'm in Omaha, but no, in Washington. I once gave a paper at a conference. And it was on Balthazar's Trinitarian ontology. And I got, I got all done. It was like a 50 minute presentation. You know, one of those boring deals where you read a paper Mm -hmm. to people don't care, (laughs) but I got to the end of the paper and uh, a guy, I know a good guy raised his hand in in, in the Q and a and said, you know what? My overall reaction to this paper is just, it's so typical of you Balthazarians. You guys constantly want to jump immediately into the deep end of the pool. And, and I said, well, yeah, yeah, exactly. We're jumping into, I said, I said, cause I know the guys are Ronarian. I said, you can stay in the shallow end with your Ronarian swimmies on if you want. While the rest of us, both are free, are free forming over the deep end. But it's true. I mean, you get, when you, one of the things I love about Balthazar is he drags you into the deep end of the pool. You, there is no remaining in the shallow end. There is no journalistic approach to anything, even in his smaller, more occasional works. All right, you're, you're reading along and you're realizing this, this book requires contemplation, meditation, uh, thinking through his scriptural sources, his patristic sources. So a simple book of 80 pages might take you weeks to really digest properly. I don't, for the life, it's a good thing dissertations are written by the young, because I don't have the faintest idea how I read all that stuff that Balthazar wrote uh, when I was, when I was a young man, but that's his, but that is his project. And it's a deep one. It's a profound one. So you might be tempted to think, well, I don't know about the enlightenment. I don't know all about God hold blessing. I don't know about the divided line. I don't know about Gnostic formlessness. I don't know about this whole debate beginning with Hegel and through all the others about, well, how does 
how does the divine and the worldly relate? How do the infinite and finite relate? But that those are all the topics that he's dealing with here in the entirety of his trilogy. And then in the first in the first part of the trilogy, the aesthetic, he's trying to make the case that just because there is a particularity and historicity to God's revelation in Christ, if one thinks through this properly, it doesn't preclude the breaking in the epiphany of an absolute revolu- revelation for a for a, and that's then the burden of the book is to show why an absolute revelation can indeed manifest itself through the very particularities of the history of a single man Jesus of Nazareth i think that's really important to understand because it doesn't just have the implications for religion this is the implications of culture of society because the burning question for so many, particularly in our time, but I think it's true for every time, is how did we get here? What has happened? Where yeah. are we going? And so we want to understand why. You can't understand why often unless you go back and to reflect, as he did, on how we got here. And so he clearly shows yeah. the implications of how we got to the point where we are in our thinking and our manner of ascertaining and receiving that revelation. And the, the difficulty comes in in reading Balthazar in that he's not going to give simplistic answers to that question of how we got to where we are now. Because the fact is, proper intellectual genealogies of how we got to where we are now are going to appreciate the multifocal nature of the causes. You know, I mean, it's like I once knew an Orthodox priest who said, I can trace for you in five easy historical steps from the filioque way to Hitler. (laughs) You know, so, you know, and and you just say, okay, well, fine. I think you've missed several steps along the way, Father, Mm -hmm. uh, that the filioque way did not cause Hitler. But nevertheless, you get my point. An intellectual genealogy is going to have to be complex, and Balthazar is. He doesn't just root it in the wrong turn taken by the Enlightenment in, in, in turning towards contingency and opposing it to eternity. I mean, he goes all the way back to the Gnostics, to the Greeks, to the Christians themselves. He even sees that in Aquinas we've made a certain wrong turn in, in some ways, that the scholastic method geared towards the university takes theology out of the context of the monastery and renders it more sterile, more rational, uh, more arid. Uh, and, and therefore, even though he, he quotes Aquinas more than anybody in his trilogy, and he clearly loves Aquinas, but he's not beyond saying, here's a problem, though. As soon as the context for, more, for theology goes from monastery to university, you've got a different kind of theology going on, more rationalistic, and that has implications. The beauty of Balthazar and his method is that, and you and I had a, a conversation prior to beginning, about footnotes. When you read Balthazar and you just enter into his mind and his set, he will always lead you to what brought him there, the authentic yes. resource or source of the actual thought, that's origin, where that came from. So if he's talking about one of the fathers of the church or he's talking about a scholastic, he actually, because of his depth, not only his command of languages, But, I mean, his ability to be able to go there. But he will show you, do you see? Look at what this writing was and look what this thought was, and that's how we got there. This is such an important point you're raising because one of the criticisms that is often raised uh, towards Balthazar, and sometimes even by his sympathizers, is that his uh, retrieval of various authors, either patristic or theological or philosophical, is not to be trusted because he gives those thinkers such an idiosyncratic reading. Uh, He retrieves them through the lens of his own creativity, a creativity which some of his critics appreciate, but then will emphasize, yeah, but when you read Balthazar on Plato, you need to go back and read Plato himself, because you, you can't be, well, my response to that, well, is exactly That's precisely what Balthazar is inviting you to do. Mm -hmm. He is presuming when he writes, for example, in the volumes on metaphysics, which is what my dissertation was on, he writes on Platonic ideas and Plotinian ideas. He's just presuming that you are going to read Plato too. Mm -hmm. 
you're going to read Plotinus too. And you're going to be able to see when you do that his reading of those authors is not complete, of course, because you can't exhaust them, but has a point. And he does. And so when I was doing my dissertation, I went, I was reading Balthazar and I said, okay, I'm doing a dissertation here on these volumes on the metaphysic. So I need to reread Plato and I need to read Plotinus. And then I went back and reread Balthazar and I said, uh, he's right. (laughs) He's absolutely right. So I think this is a very, very important point that in order to properly understand Balthazar, which some of his vicious critics do not, they do not read him, number one, charitably. They read him with an eye towards mining little nuggets of things taken out of context that can be weaponized against him because they have an ecclesial agenda. But then also they don't follow Balthazar's method properly of retrieving authors by reading them. Going back to those sources that uh, so much of Balthazar, for example, is uh, in some sense an answer to modern German idealism. So one of the problems I had in writing my dissertation was that I was not an expert on on German idealism. So I had to go back and, and actually read. You know, all of these guys, Fichte, uh, you know, Holderlin, all, all, these, all these guys who write in this dense metaphysical language, but it was absolutely critical in order to understand the Balthazarian project that you do those things. Otherwise, you're going to get Balthazar wrong. And that is the problem for a casual reader, to come back to our sort of original point. When you're picking up even a small book like Love Alone, you are being invited into an adventure And that's what, when I go back to the first video that you and I made, when Father Morganroth, my spiritual director, threw a copy of it at me and said, here, read this, it'll make you less stupid. Uh, And I read it, and it took me a year to really digest, but it absolutely revolutionized my entire life, because I realized here is a theological project that has to be gone into with the totality of your being and your mind in order to properly understand it. This is not for a a sort of drive-by mining of information. You have got to go into it. In this particular book, this is why I think this one is so important, and for the Christian to really dive into, because the subject of what is love, I mean, we know that God is love. John tells us that. It's not a, a cute meme it's not, you know, just something you put on a, uh, on a placard and you put it on your doorway. And yes, you should. Absolutely. That's fine if people want to do that. But you have to live it. And why would you live it? Why is this important? Why yeah. and how do you do it? And he's attempting to show the, the, the nexus of it all. That, as you, as you said, the revelation, the logos, do you understand why this is our operating system? And it and so that's why in the beginning of the again it's a it's a seems like a little book but it's at the very heart literally the heart of the who heart we are. of everything. So just even look at the universal scope of what it is that he's trying to do here. I mean, he begins as I th- as, you know he begins with the cosmological argument of the early church fathers and how they tried to embed Christ into a sort of almost Platonic hierarchical matrix of some some kind. And then you get uh, an anthropological approach in the modern world, right? Where Christ is seen as the fulfillment of all the longings of human trends. He's the most maxed out human being. I don't want to repeat too much. I think we talked about a lot of that in the last session. And so then Balthazar comes along and says, okay, those are both okay as far as they go, but they both miss the boat. They both miss the point and they ultimately reduce Christ and domesticate him. What breaks out in the absolute singularity, in the concrete universal that is Christ, is the absolute revelation of love that shatters categories, even as it fulfills them. Well, I mean, one of the most central images that Christ leaves us with in Scripture is you have to pour new wine into new wineskins. But what he doesn't say is forget the wine and forget the wineskins. You're still putting wine into wineskins. It's it, but it, it, but you have to be careful because. What Christ is going to reveal is going to shatter and destroy and burst all of our, all of our old categories. But in order to show how those categories can be in a sense, put back together and and lifted up. In other words, Christ did not come as a destroyer of categories. 
shatters them, yes, but he wants to put them back together in order to raise them up into something higher. And this is Balthazar's point. What is that something higher? What is that holieristic point that makes the historical life of the man Christ so paradigmatic of an absolute revelation of God? So let's start with the beginning. Balthazar wants to begin with an analogy from art. I mean, hence the aesthetics. And what, he's, what he says is, you know, look, you know, when, when you listen to Mozart, and he was a great expert on Mozart, and, and he loved Mozart. When you, when you listen to Mozart, you get a sense, and here are echoes of Goethe, you know, you get a sense of the gestalt of a work of art, how it sort of hangs together and creates a kind of splendor, a lumen, a light shines forth from this work of art because of, in a sense, the coming together of freedom and mind and creativity and will to produce a, a, a sort of symphony that is just so, so that you realize, you know, that it's perfectly constructed. There's a great scene from the movie Amadeus, which Balthazar, of course, never saw, on the life of Mozart. And it's probably apocryphal, not true. But Mozart, after one of his concerts, meets the emperor, and the, the emperor says he thought the concert had too many notes. <laughs> it was too long. So Mozart said, well, Sire, which notes would you like me to remove? <laughs> And so and this is my point. You can't remove any of them and have it be what Mozart wanted to be. And that's Balthazar's point. And a great stellar work of art, everything holds together perfectly. And it really is the manifestation of something that transcends those parts. So he uses art as an analogy here for Revelation. It can't be, you know, it's an analogy. And in Revelation isn't just reducible to the uniqueness of a work of art. But it is certainly true that a work of art also isn't simply a subjectivist, idiosyncratic pile of, of meaningless projections from the individual author, uh, artist. The artist has tapped into something real. Or the gestalt, the whole, creates a lumen or a light that Balthazar calls a certain uh, glory, a certain splendor. And then when, when you talk about it in a divine register in Revelation, it is definitely then kabod, glory. And it's interesting, you know, the Hebrew word for kabod, Kavod sometimes is means weight. Mm -hmm. It means density, gravitas. And so this is sort of Balthazar's point. It's very biblical that the, the Bible teaches not that God is like in some ethereal gas, less real than the real. God is the densest thing that is. And the, the, the thing with the most reality and the most gravitas. And thus when it manifests itself in concrete form, what bursts out is a kind of splendor and a kind of glory that is, that is uh, overwhelming. But then it's in the section here called Love Must Be Perceived, Balthazar wants to point out that human beings do have a capacity to perceive it. There has to be an analogical connection there of some kind. So, you know, as, as Goethe once said, if the, if the eye were not already sun-like, it could never see the sun. So there's an element here of, of there's something artistic in us already that is capable of seeing beauty, and there is something within us that is capable, in a sense, of detecting God as he comes forward. Then anyway. Yeah, I think that's an important thing for us to ponder, too, because there's a certain paradigm, isn't there? And I think he addresses that in the beginning of the book, in that second section on the anthropological reduction, that yeah. he kind of traces back to where we almost, I don't know how else to say this, but almost we began to think ourselves into a Godhead in a way that somehow we began to believe that we could perceive and understand God and know all things and be all things somehow because of our own nature and then we philosophically right. moved into that. And what all that did was put us into an unbelievably small little box. Oh, it sure did. And this is the, the difference in between sort of Balthazar's construal of how there's a preparatio within us, an analogy within us, in order to be able to see the splendor of the form when it emerges. That is radically different from, say, the, a, a sort of Ronarianism on steroids. I don't want to be unfair to Ron or who is more nuanced. But there is a sort of Ronarian trajectory in theology uh, that my good friend Bill Portier, who runs a Ph.D. program at the University of Dayton, he calls it the American Ronarian trajectory, uh, art for short, uh, 
that essentially takes the Ronarian theology and does what you just said. As, as I said last time, I think, where, where then the anthropological tale is wagging the Christological dog, and Christ is simply reduced to certain categories of human transcendence. I mean, Ronarians talk a lot about you need to have conditions of possibility. That's, that's the fancy philosophical term. There has to be a condition of possibility within human nature to perceive God in, in, in order to do so. But they then take those conditions of possibility to be the limiting horizon within which God can manifest, and that he has to stay within the confines of those things. And then you eventually then get a sort of atheistic sort of riff on that that says, well, God is nothing more than those particular mental categories, transcendental categories, but and nothing more than that. And that's, that is Balthazar's point here. There is a latent trajectory towards at least agnosticism and possibly even atheism in all such anthropological reductions, because ultimately by the time you get to the nihilistic turn in modern philosophy, it's entirely possible to see our internal sense of transcendence is simply a tragic sense of something that's not there or an orientation to the void. Uh, it, 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 in other words, because I have a thirst for transcendence, it doesn't necessarily follow that transcendence exists. Uh, and, and this is one of the fundamental mistakes, I think, in, in many of the transcendental turns in, in modern theology. No less alike than Walter Casper in his book, The God of Jesus Christ, criticizes Ronarianism on precisely this point. So I give uh, Cardinal Casper kudos, at least for that, uh, mm. that, little, that little nugget, because I think he's entirely correct that the transcendental method doesn't necessarily lead us to Christ. He begins to move us, doesn't he, to that point where you can't methodize. You can see patterns in God's revelation. You can begin to see how he operates, but you as man can't use methods to make it happen. The revelation is God's revelation, not yours. Exactly, which is why I think the analogy with art is so very apt. Because art often veils as much as it unveils. Because what it, what it taps into are deep-seated existential questions about existence, about being, about reality, about God, that ultimately take us into categories where, you know, si comprehendis non est Deus. If you can comprehend it, it's not God. Uh, you know, there has to be an element of apophaticism in our cataphatic moment, because God does ultimately, you know, the, the great untold secret that Thomas is, at least the neo-scholastic Thomas don't want to talk about, is that Aquinas held adamantly that we cannot know God in his essence. All right. And, and there was a strong apophatic element in Aquinas, very strong, uh, that some recent authors have brought out. And there is an apophatic quality in all great art, so that even as it, you know, even as it manifests something through form, it's also veiling and hiding something that, in a sense, beckons you in further, but you cannot, it cannot be reduced to any of your categories. And this is certainly true, then, Bald, as I want to say, of Christ, all right? Christ overwhelms us, he comes to us, he provokes us, we move towards him, but there's also a great veiling of the mystery of God that remains. And in Balthazar's language, what we see is a great light and the blindness that we have with regard to understanding God completely isn't the blindness of darkness. It's the blindness of an excess of light that simply is too much. It's like trying to get a drink out of a fire hose. Okay. So it's, 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 it's really category busting in these very fundamental ways that then reduces these movements towards anthropological or historical reduction. Absolutely. Well, now welcome to John of the Cross. Yeah, when you bring <laughs> what, you well, just, yeah. what you just brought up. I mean, that's... But it's very critical to understand that Balthasar differs from the radical apophaticist insofar as he believes that the cataphatic moment is first and foremost. In other words, the, the essence of Christianity... Uh, my dissertation eventually became a book called The God Who Speaks. And the reason why I called it that was because Balthasar's entire theology of Revelation we see here in Love Alone, is predicated on the idea that God does wish to speak to us and does speak to us and does communicate with us in ways that we can at least grasp in some fashion or another because he desires a relationship with us. Therefore, the initial movement is God's. 
theology, the first theology is Christ himself. Christ is the exegesis of the Father, as Balthazar says. You know, he who sees me sees the Father. So the fact of the matter is the moment of artistic sort of splendor comes first. The apophatic moment is a moment within that, a corrective within that. If you begin simply with a radical apophaticism, then you're going to end up with all that divided line stuff. You're going to end up with gut hold lessings problem. If it's if it's apophatic turtles all the way apophatic turtles all the way down, you're never going to get to a god who actually communicates. And there's a the problem. That's what's so stunning about this because love then and I'm not trying to make it too simplistic, but I mean love is revelatory. It is, it's revelation all the way. It has to be shared. And that is the nature of the singularity. Later on in the book, you know, love is faith and justification is a chapter in here where, where Balthazar makes the point, okay, what specifically is it that comes through to us in the revelation of Christ that is so overwhelming? And it is this, two things. First, it is the absolute revelation of the love of God. A love so stunning, so unbelievably gratuitous and profligate and overwhelming that it simply is is almost impossible to believe. And that is its shocking quality. It's almost too, too much to believe. And the second aspect of this absolute singularity is, okay, so that's in a sense the cataphatic element the absolute revelation of an absolute love that comes to us in the death of Christ on the cross. But now, in a sense, comes the apophatic moment, because Balthazar says the reason why it is this stunning revelation of an absolute love, after all, it's just a dying man. How is that an absolute revelation of an absolute love? Because it's God in that man, and insofar as that man is now, in a sense, also infused with divinity or one with divinity, this man in his humanity is capable of vicarious suffering for, for the entirety of the human race. And Balthazar goes, therein is the great scandal of the cross. Therein is its great mystery. Therein is what we will never understand. How can there be this thing called vicarious suffering? You see it already intimated in the Old Testament, especially in the suffering sermon songs and so forth. But it bursts forth here in Christ that salvation is rooted in the capacity of a man to engage in vicarious suffering for all. And Balthazar says, this is what shatters our categories and simply is almost too profound for us to even believe. We have lost, I think, a sense of how shocking that notion is because we've heard it so often. Yeah, I mean, that the caricatures of vicarious suffering on the cross are oftentimes very sadistic and awful, and that therefore the only proper way to understand the power of vicarious suffering on the cross is to understand that it is an act of love. It is an act wherein Christ can forgive his tormentors, thus turning our guilt into non-guilt, into now justification for God that leads to sanctification. And Balthazar says, The great mystery of this is we don't know how that's possible. How can our guilt be turned into non-guilt and then further into sanctification through the vicarious suffering of this God-man? We will never know that. But most certainly we can meditate upon it in terms of what it means with regard to the question of love. Because it's an act of love. It can only be perceived by love. And so we must understand, therefore, that in imitating Christ, we must imitate this pattern of vicarious suffering. This is what Paul meant when he said we need to make up for what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. It doesn't mean his sufferings were inadequate. It meant that his very sufferings call for participation. And therefore, you know, and therefore, in some sense, they're not complete from our end unless we are participating in that suffering, which means our suffering, too, is also vicariously and mysteriously salvific. I mean, we all have heard Catholics say, you know, I'm going to offer it up for the poor souls in purgatory. Oh, I stubbed my toe. I'm going to offer up the pain for the poor souls. That's all kind of a form of saying vicarious suffering suffering 
for the salvation of the world is real, and it is the specific Christian vocation to, uh, to imitate and participate in that. But it has to be done and can only be seen in love. We'll continue this conversation in our next episode. This concludes part three of our conversation with Dr. Larry Chapp discussing Hans Urs von Balthasar's Love Alone is Credible. To learn more about this book or to obtain a copy, go to Ignatius.com, the website for its publisher, Ignatius Press, or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear or to download this conversation along with many other episodes of this series, visit bonbalthasar.com. There, too, you can also access numerous audio excerpts from this particular book, along with others from the Balthazar Library. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will consider subscribing to this podcast and liking it on whatever platform you may be hearing it on. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about bonbalthazar.com and join us for the next episode of Balthazar, Beauty, Goodness, Truth.